Okay, so now that we did therapeutic ultrasound, at least the basic science behind therapeutic ultrasound, we're going to do the clinical application of therapeutic ultrasound now. It's about 30 slides. Um, I'll talk pretty quick here and hopefully we can get through it pretty quick. Um, you can see the objectives for today's lecture. This first picture is a picture of a lot of things, right? So this is a picture of an ultrasound unit and it talks about the frequency, 1 or 3.3 megahertz. It talks about the BNR, the max BMR, right? So this BNR is a 5 to 1 uh, beam non-uniformity ratio. It talks about the size of the ultrasound head, 5 centimeters squared, and then the effective radiating area of 4 centimeters squared. So let's say this is the ultrasound head of 5 centimeters squared. This is good because the ERA is 4 centimeters squared. So only one centimeter right, of that ultrasound head is pretty much useless, right? So that's good. This is a vector genesis, so this is, I believe, a Chattanooga model. Tissue treatment area, right? So ultrasound can only increase tissue temperatures when the treatment area is about two times the size of the ERA. So effective radiating area. So if I know that that ERA is four centimeters squared, I can only go about eight centimeters squared, about two times the treatment area, right, of that ERA. Trying to heat a larger area will reduce the temperature increase. If the treatment area is larger, divide the area into two or more treatment zones. I see this a lot with athletic trainers, ATs that have been out in clinical practice for longer periods of time. Say they're trying to do an ultrasound on a hamstring. Hamstrings goes for, right from your glute, your butt, to your knee, essentially, a little bit past your knee. And I'll see them going up and down the whole hamstring. That's a waste of their time, energy, and essentially money, right? Patient's time as well. You need to do it a smaller area. As you can see, this, this picture here, this guy's uh, shirt off, one, two, three. So they took the ultrasound head, bam, right here in the middle. And they went each direction, the size of one sound head or one ER. Uh, two times the ERA, right? So they started right here in the middle, go on each side, and this is the treatment zone for the ultrasound. So this person may have deltoid issues going on, some uh, deltoid tendonitis or uh, bursitis, I should say, and maybe they're doing ultrasound right here in this area, right? They're not doing the whole arm, right? They're not doing this whole area. They're leaving it within this box. So again, they can go in, right? up and down, or side to side, up and down. They can go in circles within the box. Coupling methods, right? We talked about ultrasonic waves cannot pass through air. You must use a transmission medium. Should be non-reflective. The optimal medium is distilled water. Nobody ever uses that though, right? <laughs> Everyone uses ultrasound gel. You buy it from the Medco catalog or whatever uh, catalog you buy your equipment from. Damage to crystal. So you can actually damage a crystal if you just hold the ultrasound up in the air, you turn it on, as high as it can go, those sound waves are going, it's reflecting and refracting, right? The compression uh, and refraction of the crystal. How can that damage the crystal? Think about that for now uh, in your heads and think, how could that damage the crystal? With direct coupling, the transducer ultrasound head is applied directly to the skin with gel between the ultrasound head and the skin. Apply the gel liberally to the area. Make sure the larger air bubbles are out of the gel. Always have more gel than you think. Some people's bodies absor absorb the gel quicker and you don't realize it. Um, people with drier skin, right, will absorb the gel pretty quickly. Don't be afraid to put more gel on as you're doing the ultrasound. So I always have the towel, the ultrasound head, right, unit, and then the gel right next to me so I can easily get the gel on if I feel like I'm getting low on gel. Poor conductivity increases the spatial average intensity. What does that mean? Remember what spatial average intensity is? Hmm. Use firm constant pressure. So ultrasound head is in my right hand. Do an ultrasound in my left hand right here. Just barely touching the skin with ultrasound head, not going to do anything. Right? Don't be afraid to push a little bit, almost massage-like a little bit. That's fine. Move in circular along the two most strokes and go slow and steady. Slow and steady wins the race here. If you're doing ultrasound on somebody, my form, don't go like this. That's bad. Nice and slow. Right? But don't stop. 
in one spot for too long because you could actually burn the patient, remember? What, do you think, what about hydrocortisone cream or biofreeze? A lot of people will mix biofreeze in and hydrocortisone cream. What do you think will happen? Is it effective or not? In one of the modalities books I've used in years past, there's a chart in that book and it talks about how ineffective using hydrocortisone cream and biofreeze is as a topical agent with ultrasound because of the barrier that it's not a good medium. <laughs> yes, the pad or bladder method. I don't know anyone that's ever used this. I already know why I'm talking about it. A balloon, a condom, a plastic bag filled with water or gel. Now, say you're working at a high school and you break out a condom filled with water and place that on, on, a, on a high school age student. That is, uh, the mom and dad or whoever, parent guardian, will be contacting you, the principal, whatever, so fast. Don't even go there. If they have an irregular shaped area like a hand, a foot, put the body part in water and place the ultrasound head in the water and we'll do it differently, all right? We'll talk about that actually, I think a little in a little bit. This is an old school gel pad that nobody uses anymore. Now the ultrasound wave, all right? This is just straight gel, like the ultrasound gel would be. So now that ultrasound has to go through, um, the ultrasound uh, sound wave has to go through this, what, three, four inches of ultra uh, of the gel pad and then into the skin so it's not as effective and why you'd use it on the quad right there makes no sense so the immersion technique is the best uh, I guess for irregularly shaped areas body part is placed in a tub of water plastic tubs are not recommended because they absorb ultrasonic energy tap water immersion you usually use a 3 megahertz ultrasound that's less effect uh, sorry using 3 megahertz ultrasound is less effective in increasing tissue temps than direct coupling but if you have an irregularly shaped area you can place the body part in the water place the ultrasound head in the water have a little bit of a gap all right and be careful because you'll get air bubbles actually on the ultrasound head and you have to whisk the air bubbles away all right place the sound head about one half inch or half an inch away from the body part should be parallel with the skin surface at 90 degree angle so say this is my body part I'm getting ultrasound on this is the sound head about a half inch away all right bam the issue with this is it has to travel through the sound water all right the wave has to travel through the sound water into the body part and back you can create hot spots quicker with this method all right that's the inverse square laws, essentially why we have it at 90 degree angle. Big thing with, with this, again, is you're going to create um, air bubbles. So make sure you wisp away the air bubbles with a tongue depressor. All right. So that's more than a half inch, but you can see body parts in the body of water, immersion, ultrasound head, bam, right on the body part. Output frequency. Depth and rate of heating are based on the output frequencies. One megahertz tissues uh, targets tissues at least five <coughs> excuse me five centimeters deep. Three megahertz goes up to two centimeters deep. So what would you use on a patella tendon? Patella tendon is actually pretty superficial, right? So we'd probably use three megahertz. Gastroxoleus complex for your calf muscles essentially. They can be pretty deep. There's a lot of issue or tissue there, fat and, and other uh, muscle. So maybe we use a one megahertz on the gas rock. I think I didn't, um, yeah, I thought I had something else there. I guess I didn't. Same thing, duty cycle. So this, all these things coming up now are kind of taking last lecture material and incorporating them into thought provoking clinical application, if you will. So duty cycle determines the treatment effects will be thermal or non-thermal. Though they, they're truly never separate, remember, right? So 25%, you're still getting slight uh, thermal effect versus 100% thermal. All right. So when would you use a 25% duty cycle? What about a 75% duty cycle? All right. So if I just have an acute ankle sprain today, maybe I can use a 10 or 25% duty cycle, whatever the lowest one for that machine is. But maybe three days from now, as the right, we're going through the healing stages now. Maybe I think it's okay to start bumping up to 50, 75, 80, 95, whatever the highest on that machine is besides 100%, right? That makes sense. 
So output intensity of continuous and pulsed. Continuous output, spatial average temporal peak intensity measured in watts per centimeter squared. And then the pulsed output is spatial to average temporal average, and that's also measured in watts per centimeter squared. All right, so make sure you're looking at that handout that I have uh, up on Blackboard and that was used last lecture as well. Thermal treatments, these tend to be progressive increase um, in tissue temperatures during the first six minutes of treatment. Then the rate of increase tapers out. Why? Hmm. Law of Garthus Draper, maybe, attenuation, half layer value. I could go on, but I think you get the point, all right? The patient may report warmth or heat uh, during the thermal treatments, but they should not report any pain or burning. And newer ultrasound units, actually, you can turn the head on. So like a warming uh, selection button option, I guess you could say. And it actually does heat the ultrasound head, so the patient does feel warmth. But the patient really shouldn't feel much during ultrasound. It's kind of one of those weird things, like you explain to them, okay, put this gel on you, it's going to be cold, it's always cold. And then you start rubbing the ultrasound head on, and we're like, uh, I don't feel anything. So this is... I guess I don't have, you yeah. This is heating output, rate of heating with one megahertz output. So for tissue temperature increase in Celsius again, um, and, and on the bottom here is what you turn up the output intensity to on the machine. All right, we'll <coughs> measure in watts per centimeter squared. I've seen some people do ultrasound for four minutes. You're really not doing much, one megahertz. All right, one megahertz is what? More deep, right? So if I want to get deep tissue, I need to be in that long range over here, seven to 10 minutes probably. Anything really over 10 minutes at this two watt, 2 2.0 watts per centimeter squared is in the caution zone. We're gonna probably burn that patient. They probably will feel some pain, even 175. I almost never go above 1.5 when I do an ultrasound, uh, watts per centimeter squared when I do an ultrasound treatment on a patient. Typically, 7 to 12 minutes for an ultrasound or 7 to 10 minutes. Anything less than that, you're really not getting any therapeutic uh, heating, depending actually where you're trying to heat, right? So if you look at this chart, and you can tell by the, if it's at 0.5 watts per centimeter squared, you do that for 12 minutes, you might get a little bit over a degree Celsius temperature increase. But if you're doing, you know, 125 to 15 watts per centimeter squared, you could get anywhere from really... Uh, almost two to almost uh, four degrees Celsius. So if you're trying to deform the tissue and actually stretch that patient, you want vigorous heating, right? So vigorous heating for a longer period of time. And then after the ultrasound treatment is done, remember you only have a three to four minute window to actually do a stretch on that patient to deform that tissue. So we heated that tissue, made it pliable, malleable. Now we have to deform that tissue. So 3 megahertz, a little different. It's superficial, but it doesn't last as long, right? So if I'm doing ultrasound in the 3 megahertz, more superficial, it's going to heat faster, right? So if I look at my, my standard range here, 1.25 to 1.5 watts per centimeter squared, at 5 minutes, that's getting almost an increase of 4 degrees Celsius. 5 degrees Celsius, that's almost in the caution zone here, a little over 4 if I'm doing 1.5 watts per centimeter squared at 3 megahertz. Why? More superficial. There's less attenuation, there's less half layer value, there's less law of growth draper stuff going on, right? <laughs> so essentially, 1 megahertz you're going to have to heat or, or do the treatment a little bit longer. 3 megahertz you have to do the treatment shorter because the chances of you actually uh, burning or injuring the patient increase. So non-thermal treatments, that's all thermal, right? Thermal, thermal, 100% duty cycle. Non-thermal treatments, intensity and duration are largely based upon experience and anecdotal evidence. Could do 100% duty cycle on output intensity of less than uh, 0.3 watts per centimeter squared. Don't do that. Change the setting to 25% duty cycle or whatever the lowest, you know, whatever it is on the machine and change the output parameter intensity accordingly. You like I said, you could do 100% duty cycle, so it's 100% on at a low watt per centimeter squared, but yeah. Length of the, uh, depends on output frequency, output intensity, duty cycle, and the goals. What are your goals of actually doing a therapeutic ultrasound for a patient? That goes into your treatment duration. 
So vigorous heating, 10 to 12 minutes for 1 megahertz. 3 to 4 minutes for 3 megahertz. There's a table in the one book that lists more durations. You can definitely look at that. I'm not going over them in depth. Combo treatments are pretty cool. So using ultrasound electrical stimulation together. So, and I always have to look at the machine. Every machine's a little different. And even though I have the one in our education lab that I've been using for the five years I've been here, literally every time I use combo, I still look in the motor, uh, in the manual because I can never remember. It's one of those things in life, right? So you use ultrasound and stim together. Great for uh, trigger points. Ultrasound head serves as an electrode. Then you have another electrode that's on the body somewhere. And as you're doing ultrasound, that electricity is actually going through the ultrasound head. And it's acting like a ultrasound treatment. Ther theoretically, you're getting ultrasound benefits on top of the stim benefits. I love combo for like hamstring strains because I can help decrease their pain a little bit. I can get into a trigger point and really get into that trigger point and try to break up some scarring and all that fun stuff. And it's pretty cool when you do this and you get a trigger point, you can actually like contract the muscle and make them twitch and dance. It's pretty funny actually. So bam, dispersive electrode, active electrode, ultrasound. And that's the dispersive electrode. That's the active electrode. So this would be somewhere else in the body. This is where the trigger point is. And this is the small, you know, two to three times the size of the sound head that we're doing ultrasound on. Indications of ultrasound, why we'd use ultrasound. So for pulse ultrasound, chronic or acute inflammatory conditions, joint reduction, or sorry, pain reduction, joint contracture, muscle spasms, or neuroma, scar tissue definitely, trigger points, warts. I've actually never tried these for warts. It's interesting, interesting. And post-acute myositis ossificans. So remember, myositis ossificans is a formation of bone usually due to repetitive trauma to an area. Football players get this a lot, like their biceps or quadriceps, they keep getting a helmet right to that area new bone will form because of Wolf's Law. So theoretically, ultrasound can help break up some myositis ossificans. Why you would not use ultrasound? Acute conditions for continuous ultrasound. Ischemic areas, areas of impaired circulation, DVT, deep vein thrombosis, cancerous tumors, pregnancy over pelvic or lumbar areas. If they have a foot injury, I can probably use ultrasound on their foot, right? Acute fracture, Exposed metal, over replaced joints using plastic or bone cement. So maybe they had a joint replacement, maybe we want to use ultrasound. We have to make sure we have to look at surgical notes even to see what happened there. All right, see what the surgeon did. Around eyes, heart, skull, carotid sinus, genitals. Why you'd use it around any of those, I don't know. Thorax with a pacemaker. Breast implants, really? Why you would do that there, I don't know. Stress fractures. Menstruating females, again, that's like a contraindication for everything. I have no idea why. Honestly, no physiological explanation why. Hmm. I always hated going over that part in anatomy and physiology back when I was in college. It just made no sense to me, all the, the physiological aspects of that. Um, so that's probably why it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to lie. Precautions around the spinal cord. Hmm. So sometimes people say this with electrical stimulation as well, they won't cross the spine. Why? You Well, same thing with ultrasound, you have cerebral spinal fluid that's encased in your spinal cord, right? The spinal cord's encased in the cerebral spinal fluid. So theoretically, by ultrasounding and bubbling and heating the tissue, we're heating that, that cerebral spinal fluid and can cause some damage. I've done it before, not cause damage, I've done ultrasound over the spinal cord or around the spine, no issues. Anesthetized areas of skin makes sense. They don't. They can't feel that area of the skin. Makes sense. High doses of over ectopic bone, metal implants. As long as you technically keep the sound head moving, you could use it over metal implants. But I probably wouldn't use it over metal implants personally. And epiphyseal plates, so growth plates essentially. So if they're area of, of growth, right? So growth plates in children, I wouldn't use ultrasound. It can inhibit the growth, right? Thermal effects increases nerve conduction velocity, blood flow, macrophage activity, extensibility of collagen-rich structures, non-thermal increases cell membrane permeability, tissue regeneration, stimulating phagocytosis, and synthesis of collagen. How do I prep the patient? Well, make sure they have no contraindications. Determine the method and mode of application. Um, clean area. How many people actually clean the area? I'm not sure. 
ID treatment area based on ERA. So effective radiating area, the size of the sound head, essentially two to three times the size of that area. And determine the coupling method used. Almost always gel right on the body, right? Explain sensations. Uh, you shouldn't feel really feel anything. You might feel a little warmth. That's about it. To begin, make sure the intensity is at zero before turning the power on. Most units you have to turn the machine on first and it's automatically set at zero. Set the appropriate mode. Pulsed, continuous, if it is pulsed, is it 25, 50, 75, whatever it is, right? Set your time. Begin slowly moving the sound head over the medium. Back up, put the medium on the patient. Then slowly begin moving the sound head over the medium. Then you slowly increase intensity. We don't want to increase intensity without putting it on the, uh, before we put the ultrasound head on the patient because it's an error, right? And technically, if that's for a long period of time, we could damage the crystal. So ultrasound gel, start slowly moving it. Then you turn up the dial to 1.0 watts per centimeter squared. And then you can slowly move it at a moderate pace. Slowly at a moderate pace. That makes sense, right? Man, if pain, if the patient says, ow, or ooh, that's burning, or it's too hot, move head, sound head quicker, and even decrease the intensity. And as time goes on, apply more gel if needed. Again, make sure you have a towel or whatever you're going to use to help clean up the gel off the ultrasound head and off the patient. I think the clinical application part is a little bit easier for ultrasound than it is for electrical stimulation because stem there's you know five, six, seven different modes. Ultrasound is ultrasound. I mean, there's continuous and non-thermal, but it's relatively easy, I think. But the physiological aspects and terminology can be overwhelming because a lot of the terminology sounds exactly the same. Slow and steady wins the race, but not too slow, right? So you move the ultrasound uh, head slow. But again, if you move it too slow, you can cause hot spots, burn, periosteal pain. You're essentially burning their bone. That hurts. Ensure no contraindications prior to treatment. Collect patient outcome data. I didn't actually say this earlier. When you do an ultrasound or any modality on the patient, make sure that they have, you, you say, okay, what's your pain like today? Pain's at 10 out of 10. Okay. By doing the stim, let's say, I'm hoping to decrease in your pain by at least two points, right? After you get done with this thing, okay, what's your pain like now? So you actually can tell, did this do anything or no? Same thing with ultrasound. If you're trying to increase range of motion, use a goniometer before and after, right, measure range of motion. If you're trying to decrease the patient's pain, take a pain scale. Whatever that your goal and measure you're, that you're trying to achieve, figure out a measure for it before and after. Pretty easy, I think, right? That is it on ultrasound. Please, again, ask me, email me, call me, text me if you have questions.